So, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing to you Reed Sherd, who in turn will introduce Professor Rick Ifland. Reed joined Westmont in October 2008 as Chief Information Officer and took over additional responsibility as the Vice President for College Advancement in January 2010. He led the launch of the Bright Hope for Tomorrow campaign, the largest capital campaign in Westmont's history. He has authored a number of art articles on innovation and technology and served on numerous boards. Most recently, Dr. Sheard provided leadership to the Higher Education Practice Group of the CIO Executive Council along with serving on the board of the MIT Enterprise Forum for the Central Coast. Dr. Sheard and Westmont College received the InfoWorld 100 top IT projects in the Cloud Computing Initiative category for 2009. Dr. Sheard graduated from University of Sioux Falls earned a Master's of Divinity degree at Fuller <coughs> Theological Seminary and a doctorate in higher education leadership from Seattle University. Previously, Dr. Sheard worked in uh, General Electric, Apple Incorporated, Consonas Inc., and George Fox University as an assistant professor of leadership studies. He served at, um, at Spring Harbor University in Michigan as vice president and CIO for uh, five years before coming to Westmont and he's fabulous. <laughs> Come speak and introduce. <laughs> well, it's good to be here and to hear about uh, Bright Hope for Tomorrow. Rick and I actually traveled coast to coast uh, during that, and it was early in my tenure at the college. And I want to read a few things about Rick and then just share a little bit about my relationship with him and then look forward to what he has to share with us tonight. Rick Ifflin is a successful entrepreneur and private equity investor, directs Westmont's Eaton program for entrepreneurship and innovation. He also teaches courses as an associate professor of economics and business, chairing the department. He is working to complete funding for the Eaton program and the Eaton chair in economics and business. Professor Ifflin started a company that transformed automation in the mortgage credit industry eventually selling it to a Fortune 500 company. He has since purchased 29 companies, improving and selling 24 of them. Still active as an executive and shareholder in Five Ventures, as a general partner of Oxford Holdings LLC, he engages students in his work, exposing them to business as varied as new product, medical devices, innovation, air ambulance transportation, and global research. While excellence in business typically translates into making profit, Professor Ifflin also seeks to make a difference. He's led and established non-governmental organizations to help the poor, Middle East, and Africa. Rick has majored in economics and business at Westmont, has earned an MBA from the University of Kentucky, and a master's degree in international law from Oxford University. Early when I came to Westmont, you know, you're trying to make sure everybody is impressed by you or at least something. <laughs> And I got a call from our, at that point, uh, trustee Rick Ifland, and uh, it was just really for me a real transformational moment where uh, a new employee in a new place, uh, separated from his family, um, trying to do good work, had someone come along. And this is what I think you'll hear tonight, that uh, Rick is absolutely committed to building businesses that are quite successful. I mean, why else would you do it? But on top of that, or in addition to that, um, businesses that matter, caring for people, whoever they are, wherever they find themselves in life as they cross his path. There's just a, a real sense of responsibility and opportunity that Rick sees in each one of these engagements. Uh, whether it's finding a company and trying to restore it back to health or working with an individual that he happens to meet on a flight coming between Kentucky and here as he does every week. Uh, Rick's uh, an alum, he's an apparent, uh, he's a former trustee, he's a professor, he's all in when it comes to what we're trying to accomplish at the college, and I think you're in for a real treat. One housekeeping item, there are several of you that have gathered together for further conversations based on tonight's lecture. Sandy White, who's sitting right up here, has directions to the house that you're going to uh, following this, so you just see Sandy. I, uh, part of the secret group that's doing that. <laughs> um, but without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Rick Ifflin. Well, 
Well, thank you. It is great to be here, and uh, I really appreciate the Westmont Foundation and all that you do. Um, it is truly appreciated, both as a, well, not both as, as a, as a parent, as an alum, as a former trustee, um, as now as a professor. You just do a lot, and we really, really appreciate it. Um, as Reed said, I, I, um, I travel back and forth from Lexington, Kentucky to um, Santa Barbara, and I do that every week that school is in session. And I'd, how many people have read the book, Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day, a whole bunch of you? <laughs> I've had about three days in a row like that. Um, it started, I won't, I, won't, I won't tell you all of the things that happened, but one of the things that happened was I went from Lexington to Atlanta. If you read on the news what's happening in Atlanta, it's not very fun. There's about three quarters of an inch of ice on all the planes and on the trees and everywhere else. And it took a long time to get here um, this week. But uh, one, of, one of the planes was delayed, which meant my next flight I was rushing to. And I ended up running onto the plane. I was the last person to get on the plane. I have my carry-on. I have my backpack. I have my laptop out. I have my Wall Street Journal. I have my coat. And I'm walking down the aisle, and everyone's waiting for me to get into my seat. And I get to my seat, and I don't know if you've experienced this or not, but um, I felt like Gulliver. Have you ever have you ever looked at the seat that you're supposed to sit in for almost five hours, and the guy next to me was hanging over the side, and they're ready to leave? and I've got to get all my stuff situated. And so what I did was I start shoving things underneath the seat in front of me, and I was gonna put something in the little pouch that's in front, um, except that's apparently where my knees were supposed to go because there's no room for anything else. I still have my coat, I'm shoving that over, the um, flight attendant took my carry-on, and I have my, my paper. And so what I did is I just, I put my paper down on the seat and I sat on it and I buckled up and I'm shoving all this stuff in and the guy next to me no kidding says are you reading that <laughs> and I mean I'm a reasonably talented guy but I, what, what do you what do you do <laughs> I know what I was thinking. I'm thinking, please remove yourself from the gene pool. I mean, I, I, I shouldn't say that, but that's what I was thinking. And how do you respond to that? I, I've got students here. If you've ever wondered and a professor says there's no such thing as a stupid question, there are such things as stupid <laughs> questions. And so I'm sitting here with a guy that is hanging over in my seat that I'm going to be rubbing shoulders with for five hours, and he's asking me if I'm reading the paper. And then it occurred to me, you know, you might as well have some fun. And so I unbuckled myself and I stood up and I turned the paper over <laughs> and I sat back down on it and I said, well, yes, sir, I am. <laughs> it was a long flight. And it kind of goes on and on and on. It's like three days of that. Um, so I was looking for some encouragement. And, and I talked to my wife this morning and I was telling her, reminding her that I'm giving this lecture tonight. And, and she said, we've been married about almost 33 years and, and she knows me well, we met at Westmont. And she said, you know, Rick, just to try not to be too smart, try not to be too funny, try not to be too clever. Just be yourself. <laughs> Uh, you know, and I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. So, so then I go to my son, who's actually in the audience, looking for a little bit of encouragement after three days of uh, not a lot of fun, and was telling him about all this, and he said, you know, Dad, I think it's in Numbers 22 where God actually used a jackass to speak. And I thought, great, I'm not gonna get any support there either. So. I'm hoping you as strangers treat me more kindly than the airlines and more kindly than my own family. 
Well, we're, we're talking about um, globalism and microfinance and social business. And these are complex issues. They can also be um, highly emotive and they can be very toxic because you may have a viewpoint that is far to the left or far to the right. You may be more evangelical about um, social justice issues than, than I am about my faith. You, you all come with biases. I come with biases as well. And, and as I talk about some of these things, especially in light of a guest speaker that we'll have at the President's Breakfast, I, I actually take exception to some of the things that, um, that he has said and done. And I, and I don't do that because I, I don't respect him. I respect him highly. Um, but I was trained at, at this school, and I was trained to think independently. And I was trained to follow fact patterns, and I was trained to, um, to think for myself and come up with my own conclusions. And I was trained to look at the breadth and the depth of an issue and then come to um, a conclusion that, that, that fits for me. And so I'll share some of that um, with you. And, and you may end up landing in a different place um, than I do, but I did want to I did want to share that. So it's not just a, a an, an unabashed promotion for uh, what's happening at the president's breakfast. It's actually a um, complicated issue, um, and there's some some uh, yeah, it's just a complicated issue. So we'll get into that a little bit. Um, first, globalism, and what I want to what I want to point out in its most simplified form is that essentially globalism is really three things. It's it's just the trade of goods and it's the migration of people, and it's the flow of funds. And some people are able to participate in that fully, and some people are not able to participate that in that uh, very much. Politically, globally, politically, uh, I think there are two really uh, heavy issues that just about every country needs to deal with. And those issues are really the, the rise of economic inequality, and they are the scale of government intervention to address those. Do you intervene a lot? Do you not intervene a lot? Um, what happens and how do, you, how do you carry that out? And the reason that these are important issues is because there are roughly 7 billion people on Earth. We are part of the upper tier of top billion, roughly the G20. We're about 15% of the population. We are 60% of the wealth. And then after us, there's the, there's the middle five billion or so. And we'll talk about convergence, but they are actually kind of catching up as a percentage to us. And yet two billion of those five billion still earn less than $2 a day. Um, the growth rates per country are about 2% to 10%. And if you ever want to just look at percentages I just put the rule of 72 up there because it's actually surprising um, how well it works. If you have China growing at 7.2% a year, the rule of 72 would say take 72, divide by 7.2, you end up with 10. It'll roughly take 10 years for <coughs> China to double in growth, okay? So if you end up having the rule of 72 and you're growing at 2%, then it's going to take you roughly 36 years to double in growth. So if you're ever looking at growth rates and they're fairly consistent, if you remember the rule of 72, it'll kind of help you position um, how certain countries are growing and how rapidly they're growing. And then you have the bottom billion, and the bottom billion would be divergent. So a lot of people are catching up, that upper six billion people, but there's a billion people that are living on less than a dollar a day uh, they end up coming from 58 states, and eight of those states are failing states. And I put in there, including Haiti. We're actually, in one of my classes, um, it's titled Business at the Bottom of the Pyramid. We have 14 students that are engaging these issues. Um, to our knowledge, it's never been done before at an undergraduate level anywhere in the world. And on uh, our spring break, we'll actually be taking those 14 students and doing a red eye on Friday night and then going into Port-au-Prince, well, Miami to Port-au-Prince, Port-au-Prince to Port-au-Pay in the northwest part of Haiti, and we'll be um, starting seven companies 
uh, with the people that are there. And there's a right way to do that and there's a wrong way to do that and hopefully we're doing it um, the right way. So um, I just put Haiti in there so that you know when I refer to that again or if we have questions and answers about that, you'll know that in the Western Hemisphere it's the poorest country. It is not only one of the 58, it is one of the eight that's considered a failing state. If you slice this a little bit differently, what you'll end up with is 94% of the wealth in the <coughs> world um, comes from 40% of the people. What that means is that 6% of the wealth comes from 60% of the people. So now you can see the inequality that happens around the world and why that might be a fairly significant global issue. <coughs> On the microfinance side, um, really what we're talking about when we speak of microfinance is just simply a type of banking service that's not ordinary. Um, we're talking about um, providing microcredit to people who, let me just shift this a little bit. Essentially microfinance is a microcredit piece, which is the borrowing money. It's also saving money, and it's also providing some other forms including insurance of some safety net devices. And that's really what microfinance is. Microfinance itself inside that bottom billion is one that wouldn't, uh, it just doesn't fit the, the normal um, standard banking practices. And uh, what we're trying to do, what people that engage at issue are trying to do, is they're trying to take the unemployed and the low income people that have no collateral at all and see if they can help them via loans to become self-sufficient. That's not a new concept. It's actually started in the mid-1750s, and um, there's, a, there's a modern renaissance of that um, that's occurred over the last 30 or 40 years, um, which Muhammad Yunus has led. Uh, but the World Bank uh, recently has estimated that uh, there are more than 500 million people who participated in some form of microcredit or microfinance around the world, um, which sounds very positive when you look at that bottom billion or you look at that bottom three billion. Uh, but recently, there's also some data that would suggest that there's some cold water that's been thrown uh, on some of this uh, and on some of the more extravagant predictions that have been made. And um, some even say that the notion of a wide-ranging convergence is a myth. Okay, so if you go back to the previous slide, whoops, here, and you see that middle five billion converging with the top billion, with the slower growth of both India and China, so growing at nine, 10% rate, India historically about 7% over the last 10, 15 years, as that slows, it's being slowed down by 40% of the world's population. And as a result of that, you end up, end up having the potential for not convergence, but rather divergence or, or, um, or becoming stagnant. So there's a lot of literature around microfinance is great. There's this convergence. It's not happened um, in, in our lifetimes. And there's a lot of, of positive press about it. But there's also a counter argument that um, there's a lot of data that comes out that shows that it may not quite be as linear as we, as we thought it would. So I wanted to share that with you. Um, I'll get that in just a second. <clears throat> so microfinance, if it served 500 million people, um, it also has some recent problems. I want to read something. This is from Microfinance Banana Skins 2011, which is a report. It was a recent survey, and it was a survey of more than 500 microfinance institutions from 86 different countries. And it, it essentially said in the final analysis that credit risk was cited as the number one concern um, based on that study. One of the quotes is, poor people have um, who have accumulated large debts, more debt than they will ever be able to repay. It also said that there's an over-indebtedness that could potentially lead to heavy loan losses among microfinance institutions, adding, quote, the problem is now so broad that it has the makings of a worldwide social and economic phenomenon. 
So when you are reading about the Green Bank or you're reading about other microfinance enterprises and they say we have a loan payback of 98%, of 99%, there's some empirical data that's coming out that shows that that actually may not quite be um, the case and that there are people that went from nothing with no collateral and they've taken on debt and maybe actually um, are overweight on that debt and it's causing a fairly significant problem. The controversy even spread to Bangladesh, which is where the Grameen Bank was founded. The Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, um, declared that microfinance was, quote, sucking blood from the poor in the name of poverty alleviation. Okay, so there's a little bit recently of a twist that is occurring. It's not all linear, it's not all great, there's not all, all convergence. There's, there's some new data that's coming out. Um, what I wanted to do uh, is to put this in perspective because that's just what's happened recently. But if you, if you look at what's happened historically, that also becomes important. If you go back from about the 700s to about 1750, it's roughly a thousand years, and there is almost no annual growth worldwide anywhere. Growth was negligible. All nations are roughly equal during that thousand period, uh, year period of time. And the average person is living on less than a dollar a day. Okay, so that's a thousand years. What happened in 1750? It's the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And so from 1750 to 1950, there is rapid divergence. Everybody's the same. Now that top billion is going to begin to diverge from the other six billion people. It started in England and then it went to the rest of Europe and the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And they all grew at roughly 2% a year. Okay, back to your rule of 72, it's gonna take 26 years to double. Well, if you do that over a 200 year period of time, there's going to be a significant difference if everybody else is staying the same and you're growing at 2%. The rest of the world did remain stagnant and over that period of time, divergence occurs. <clears throat> From 1950 to the present time, so post-World War II, if you'll recall 1947, uh, GATT, the, um, the, the trade treaty that was, was there, it, was, it ended up being relatively exclusive. It was really basically for the G7 to trade back and forth. That ended up morphing into um, the World Bank. The World Bank ended up spreading to, I think it's 153 countries um, that are actively involved in the UN and that are part uh, or at least eligible for World Bank loans. So um, at that period of time, not only did you have divergence of the economy growing or not growing, you also had divergence of what's happening um, within trade among, among um, various countries. And there's plenty of examples for that. If you look at um, continental Asia and continental Africa, they are roughly the same, except that Africa actually has an advantage. And the advantage is that they end up having more natural resources. And yet, which you'll see over time, and I think as you know, um, Asia ended up growing significantly, and Africa is um, the most populated at the bottom billion. So what happened? Asia actually invested in its people, and in a lot of ways treated human resources as a natural resource. If you look at North and South Korea, again, a thousand years, roughly the same. What's happened since 1950? North Korea is now at roughly $473 per person, per capita, and South Korea is at $20,000 per capita. If you look at China in 1978, if, if you go back prior to that, um, you ended up having um, the Great Leap Forward, you ended up having um, the Cultural Revolution and a lot of other failed attempts, but in 1978, um, the average uh, Chinese per capita income for Chinese is $400, and it is now about $3,500. So you can see that it has grown fairly significantly, and I think that's, a, um, that's something that I, I think it's fairly obvious what happened there and how that happened and why that happened, uh, because they're in the, the paper um, quite a bit. In India, since 1980, 
they have gone from um, uh, roughly 6% average growth all the way through the 1990s. So they're just a little bit behind China, but not significantly behind. In Singapore, great, great example, 1960, it's a little fishing village. Um, people are making $427. It's now one of the world's leading ports and financial centers and the average per capita income is $38,000, one of the richest countries in the world. That is not over a thousand year period. This is all occurring in most of our lifetimes. So how do we solve these problems of poverty and of divergence? There, there's roughly three schools of thought, and I just wanted to introduce those to you. Um, Jeffrey Sachs would have more of a top-down approach. He was young, one of the youngest professors at Harvard at 28 years old. He was a professor. He's now the director of the Earth Institute at Columbia, prolific author, advisor to uh, um, two UN secretaries general, the last two, the current one and the former one, former director of the Millennium <coughs> Development Goals. If you've heard about the MDGs that are supposed to take place by 2015, he is one of the um, uh, key authors of that, and a former advisor to Eastern Europe. Um, it's probably worth noting that the Millennium Development Goals are not meeting their goals, and that um, as Eastern Europe went from communist governments into embracing capitalism, and he was in the middle of that, that really did not um, go very well either. So his top-down approach is probably <coughs> sketchy at best. Um, so he's on the left. On the far right is uh, William Easterly, PhD at MIT more of a bottom-up approach. He's now a professor at uh, NYU and a senior fellow at the Center for Global Development. Um, he's also a former uh, research economist at the World Bank. What Easterly would say is it's all bottom-up and we'll start getting into um, his, his um, planners versus, um, versus searchers a little bit. Uh, but in the middle is a guy named Paul Collier. He's at Oxford. Um, he's a professor of economics there. He also directs their um, African program and as a former director also at the World Bank. And what I wanted to do is just go through a few things there so that you understand it. This is actually the four traps at the bottom that would end up being something that Collier and his research um, would have developed. What he essentially he's saying is that if you look at those bottom billion people, they are trapped. It doesn't mean that they can't escape, but they are currently trapped inside of um, their, their income for one broadly, one of four reasons. The conflict trap, the natural resources trap, the land locked with bad neighbors trap, and the bad governance trap. And <clears throat> what I wanted to, to um, just point out is that Sachs on the left make very, made very bold predictions that never came true. Easterly spends more of his time arguing with Sachs than anything else. And then um, Collier's analysis of the traps actually, to me at least, feels like it's more empirically driven. He, he didn't have an agenda of writing a book about four traps and make the data force fit it. He actually did the responsible work and multiple studies with multiple people over a long period of time to study these issues nation by nation and what bubbled up from the bottom was, you can drop these into four buckets. So you can slice it and dice it other ways as well, but broadly, um, he came up with these four, four traps. Um, one way to look at what's happening is with Easterly, he talks about planners versus searchers. The planners are Jeffrey Sachs from the top down, the searchers are the people from the bottom up. And here's what he'll say about that, that we have spent we, meaning the West, have spent over a 50-year period $2.3 trillion, and yet we cannot get 12-cent <coughs> vaccines to prevent malaria, which would also present, prevent 50% of the um, childhood deaths in certain areas. And he finds that unacceptable, and I find that unacceptable. He would also say there's no way to get $4 bed nets to protect against malaria. There's no way to get $3 to new mothers to prevent newborn deaths. And um, generally, he's correct. 
That was a study that ended, I think, in 1990 or so. So if you fast forward, we've actually exceeded $3 trillion, and yet there's still a problem getting 12-cent vaccines to children who need them in order that they don't die from malaria. He would say that planners like Sachs announce good intentions. These are, these are big plans. Uh, there's a book that Sachs put out that said the end of poverty. And there's actually a quote in there that said this actually won't be all that difficult. And yet it has failed. And there's a reason that it has failed. Um, the Millennium Development Goals has been, have been delayed, but in the Millennium Development Goals, there are essentially eight goals, including the eradication of poverty. But of those eight goals, if the whole world came together, here's what we can solve. And again, it's behind plan, and um, there are, there are um, isolated examples of some successes, but it's generally been relatively difficult. Inside the Millennium Development Goals, here's why it's been difficult. There are 449 interventions by government for those eight projects. There are six UN agencies that are working on the projects, and yet they're not coordinating efforts among themselves. Um, the World Bank, the IMF, USA, uh, USAID, DFID, which are the funding agencies of both um, the UK and, and America are involved. <clears throat> and he also points out that there are roughly nine layers of bureaucracy in carrying all of that out. And by the time you get down to the ninth layer, everyone's file might be in order. So it looks good. It looks like they've done what they're supposed to do. <coughs> and yet you still end up having um, the need for that, that 12 cent vaccine that has not occurred. And so what happens is you end up with a report that shows success because everybody's file is in order, and yet you still end up having this problem. Meanwhile, we have spent $3 trillion. So that would be the Easterly's position of saying, hey, there's a problem with planners, there's a problem with um, the top down. There's also very little to no local support. There's no idea how the money or how many children there are in each location. Um, nobody knows who or what to blame, and yet there's a rhetorical advantage of promising great things, the end of poverty. It's something everybody can rally around, and yet the data would show that it's, abs it's just not working. So that's a problem. Uh, he would go on and say that poor people die for two reasons. They die because of our indifference. They also die because of ineffective efforts by those who do care. And so what he's saying is we need to revamp the way the efforts are done. Um, so the net result of, of 50, 60 years and $3 trillion is we still end up having 3 billion people living on less than $2 a day. That's the problem. So uh, what he's suggesting is that the poor are their own best searchers. Big plans will always fail to reach their beautiful goal. Politicians end up being searchers at home, there are voters there, and planners abroad, because there's non-voters there. Interesting insight. The feedback only comes from the bottom, and there's often a lack of a feedback loop because of this kind of disjointed incrementalism. So what he's suggesting is that little interventions always seem puny when compared to these grand visions, and yet those little inter interventions can do more than the planners and their $3 trillion over a five or six decade period. So um, the four traps at the bottom. The conflict trap, 73% of the people in the bottom billion have been in a conflict trap. They've been through civil war. And there's generally three causes for that civil war. There's low income, there's slow growth, and there's a primary commodity dependence that they have. There's also a 14% chance of these 58 countries being in a civil war over the next five years. That's what the data shows. 14% of these 58 in the next five years will actually be in a civil war. When a war occurs, when the conflict occurs, you actually end up having development in reverse. And what I mean by that is the average growth inside of a country 
that has civil war going on is negative 2.3 percent. The average civil war is seven years. And so the net effect of the conflict trap when you're in it is you are going to go backwards by 15 percent. And you didn't start at a very high base to begin with. Okay, so there's your conflict trap. The natural resource trap is kind of an interesting one because it's a little bit counterintuitive. 29% of these billion people are subject to the politics of natural resources. What they're talking about is if you have a natural resource and it is so prime to your economy that there is one single resource that's going to lift you out of poverty, in this trap, what generally happens is all of that money or most of that money inures to the benefit of the people that are at the top and it doesn't end up spreading out through the economy, okay? So you end up having a lot of government control of, of those resources. What's the net effect of that? Well, it's something called the Dutch disease. There is uh, oil found off of the, uh, of the coast and what happens is your currency rises because you end up having this natural resource. It could be gold, it could be silver, it could be oil, it could be whatever it ends up doing. And overall, what happens is the currency rises. So other exports are not as competitive. And when that change occurs and the economy ends up shrinking, again, it's inuring to the benefit of a few people, but not many. And what you end up having is the average person who has not participated in the upside has to pay more for their milk and for their bread and for everything else. Okay, so they didn't participate in the income, but they end up with higher expenses. That's what the natural resource trap is. If you then looked at the landlocked with bad neighbors trap, um, geography matters. If you do not have a port and you cannot export goods unless you go through your neighbor and you end up having a bad neighbor, that ends up being a significant problem. So 38% um, of the bottom billion are landlocked with bad neighbors. <coughs> Very difficult thing to, to, um, uh, to handle. Only 1% of that bottom billion does that occur outside of Africa. Okay, so this is an African problem where you have landlocked with bad neighbors and you don't end up having the right ports or you don't end up having the right, excuse me, the right infrastructure. And then finally, there's the bad governance trap. The bad governance trap is essentially the country cannot generate opportunities where none exist. If you are in a country so dominated by bad government, it's not a matter of I would like equal opportunity, not necessarily equal outcome, but I would like equal opportunity, and you never end up getting the opportunity because it's not afforded to you, that's what would be the bad governance trap. Um, you end up with an uninformed and uneducated populace. If you look at China pre-1978, that would be an example of that, and then they began educating their people, and, um, and things changed. There are a few citizens that are getting the training that they need. And the problem is that in, this, in these countries, when they do end up getting the training that they need, they end up leaving because there's no opportunities inside of their country. So you have this brain drain that is leaving the country, and that's a problem. So this is what Collier would say are the four traps, and all billion people, all 58 countries, all eight failing states would end up falling into one of those buckets or two or three or four of those buckets. The other thing that's been suggested in a lot of literature is what are the instruments? How do we end up moving out of those traps so that those billion people can begin to converge with the rest of the world and grow? And what the suggestion is is you can do that through aid, which is financial aid, you can do it through military intervention, you can do it through charters, and you can do it through trade. What I'm going to focus on is just aid, otherwise we would be here for a long, long, long time. So um, with aid, you end up having the ability to do some capacity building. If you end up with some money and you end up, and you end up using that money wisely, 
you can end up building capacity, you can teach skills, you can provide technical assistance, you can actually turn <coughs> a $15 benefit to the economy for every dollar that's spent. Okay, that's what aid can do on the positive side. You have to make sure that that happens once reform begins. So if you come in too early, it's a mistake, but once reform begins, for every dollar that is spent, you have $15 in benefit. Aid can also act as a reinforcement. Um, the early money, though, is counterproductive. You really do need to wait. And what happens is there's a disaster, there's, a, there's some, something where you finally become cognizant of a real issue, and you want to say, we will throw money at it. That can be a very costly mistake if you spend too much money too early. Okay? Money becomes useful after a few years once reform has taken hold and you need to reconcile the accountability with the incentives. So you need to be able to measure the results, you need to be able to have consistent accountability and build that infrastructure in, and you need to focus on the outcomes and not the inputs. And that's one of the knocks on the top down is that they would, they would tend to focus on, hey, here are all the inputs in my files in order. But they never get to the point of, did that person get the 12 cent vaccine that they needed? If you end up also spend, um, uh, spending some money prior to the reform, you'd want to spend it on the administration. And you'd want to spend more money, not less money. And that also can be kind of counterintuitive. The reason for that is governments will benefit from the revenue and the people will benefit from the basic services that it provides. Okay, so it's a little bit counterintuitive to what I said and yet it ends up working. So specifically, if you want to use aid to eradicate the conflict trap, you'd end up with, um, well, the, the, the left would say that the bottom billion are victims, the right would say that the bottom billion are unmotivated. And what the actual, the data actually would show is that if you want to use aid to eradicate the conflict trap, don't spend more than 16% of GDP on aid, okay? Keep in mind, you've got a disaster going on inside of that country, people living on less than a, than a dollar a day. But if you spend more than 16% of GDP with aid, that extra dollar becomes absolutely ineffective. So you have to be, you have to be very, very careful and very strategic on how it's spent. If you give aid too little or too soon, that can be a mistake. And you can also put money in the wrong hands, so you need to be very strategic about that. If you use aid to eradicate the natural resource trap, you only want to do that when the rich rulers truly want reform, otherwise it will not be effective. They'll take your money on a promise. Politically, it's going to play out well. You can say you spent billions of dollars, but the reality is it will stay inside of that. You have to have true reform or it will not work. If you use aid to eradicate the bad governance trap, possibly this is the most effective. And the reason that it is, is you can actually build in incentives, you can build in some skills, and you can build in an enforcement mechanism in order to make sure that that bad governance, governance ends up changing. Okay, so if you don't change, there's no more money, there's more of a direct correlation, it's a little bit easier to monitor. The biggest problem with that is that aid agencies, USAID, DFID, federal governments, they end up gaining by dispersing the money. They end up getting the political benefit by dispersing the money. They don't end up getting any political benefit by monitoring the effectiveness of that money. That's why $3 trillion have been spent over the last 50 or 60 years with not no effect, but with littler effect, smaller effect than you would expect from $3 trillion and a concerted effort. It's not being measured. External pressure is needed. That's what we need to do. So, essentially microfinance helps and microfinance can also hurt. We are now in a period where defaults are up, where debt is up, where actually the global environment is very hostile to newcomers. Assuming you can emerge from one of those traps, it's extremely competitive. When we were moving manufacturing from America to Asia, 
and there is a 40 to 1 difference, it's a whole lot easier than moving it from Asia into Africa where the cost is already so low and everyone's fighting for, um, for those, those jobs. So it becomes highly, highly competitive. Convergence is also questionable just because of China and India ending, uh, um, slowing down. So diminishing marginal utility suggests that you are increasing but at a decreasing rate. We're no longer growing at 9, 10%. Okay, and that ends up being a significant problem. That's what's happening inside of microfinance. So half a billion people have benefited from that. I think that their countries have. There's a new Yale study that just came out that said if you actually use as a control environment those that have received microfinance and those that have not, they don't see any material difference. I've not read the study yet, but that was kind of remarkable to me. I do think that maybe in the macro, just because you're, you're using so few, um, so, such a small amount of money to such a small number of people relative to the overall population, it doesn't quite move the needle enough, but I do know that it helps the people directly that you have benefited. So in the micro sense, I think it's benefiting those that have been recipients. In the macro sense, it's not moving the needle a whole lot. <clears throat> So now what I want to do, uh, because many of you are attending the President's Breakfast, is also talk about social business, because that's something that Mohammed Yunus, that started the Grameen Bank, billions of dollars, helped hundreds of millions of people. He's done some phenomenal things. He was ousted from the Grameen Bank, I think it was in March of 2011. <coughs> And um, since that time, and even prior to that time, he's been promoting social business. And this is probably where I take the most exception um, to where he's going, and I'll explain some of that, uh, why. I have deep respect for him. He's done more for humanity than I have done, so I don't mean to disparage in any way. But I do want to point out that there are some objections to the way that he's going about um, social business that I, I think will resonate. Um, with, with you and with me. Um, so his newest passion really is um, social business. And, and I'm wondering if it, if it is cutting edge thinking. And, and I think that it is not. Um, I think his story at the Grameen Bank is very, very exciting and inspiring. And yet lately this focus um, probably is, is not as um, um, I don't know what the right word is. It, it's, it's, I can't defend it. Um, let's put it that way. Uh, but I do want to give him a break. I mean, it, as you know, he's, he's an economist. And um, I think the economists have predicted nine out of the last five recessions. So um, they're, I'm just checking to see if you're still awake. Uh, so let's cut him a little bit of a break. But look at this new kind of business. If you do, oops, I skipped over that. Um, it's very similar to original economic theory. If you go to back to Adam Smith, the theory of moral sentiments, the wealth of nations, what he was attempting to do, what he was attempting to do is to allow companies to grow, allow people to have equal opportunities, even though not equal outcome necessarily, and to leave nobody behind, okay? It was not, it was not um, a, a grab for greed. He's actually more of a moral philosopher. If you go back to the 1750s, before we started warring among the social sciences and we all kind of carved out our little niche, the people that were engaging those issues were economists, but they were also psychologists, or they were also moral philosophers. And that's actually the bucket that um, Adam Smith fits into. So it's very similar to that. Leave nobody behind, there's no need to change the financial structure, it actually works relatively well. And that's where I would depart from, um, from Eunice. If, if Adam Smith is right, and I think that he is, then I think that there's a failure of argument by Muhammad Yunus on, on a very broad front as it relates to social business. Um, we'll look at the objections that, that I and others have to him. The way he defines social business is extremely rigid. It's almost like nothing that existed prior fits into that bucket. And yet, if you look at 
the social good and people running for-profit businesses. You can look at co-ops in England, and I think even to this day, if you fast forward, Cadbury began as a co-op in the mid-1700s. If you look at Ben and Jerry's, he said it doesn't qualify as a social business. Neither does Tom's Shoes, neither does the Body Shop. And I think that if you went to the owners of those and asked what their motivation was in engaging business, a lot of that would end up being for social justice reasons. And yet this rigid definition does not include those. I think that's a problem. He also talks about there's really no financial reward and I think that's a little bit misleading because if you actually look at the companies, the way that they're designed, the way that he would design them to be social businesses, there would be some um, uh, uh, corporate social responsibility benefits. There'd be research and development benefits that come out of there. There'd be market research that comes out of it. So we don't want to pretend that these benefits differ in any substantive way from dividends and from interests and from capital gains, which is the way the current system runs. If you actually look at the benefits that are derived from the way he's doing it and the benefits that are derived in a for-profit business, they end up being remarkably similar. And he's trying to carve out this, this little niche where he can say, this is what social business is. Uh, I have a problem with that. The other objection is that it really does allow profits to be earned. What he'll say is it's a non-dividend company, so there are no profits, and yet there are profits that are allowed to be earned, but they can only be earned by the poor. So I would start questioning how poor do you need to be? And if you are successful in that business, does that person who is poor now rise so that he's no longer poor? And if he does rise so he's no longer poor, are they now disqualified from that business? Does that business now cease to exist as a social business even though that it was, it was designed that way? So I think that that's a problem. And then I think also that the last one is that his limitations really severely constrain activity and discourage innovation. So if you want to um, artificially restrict available capital, um, or if you want to handicap those that promote capital to the sector, I think that's a mistake. And the reason it's a mistake is that the pool for these people is already too small. So why wouldn't you want banks? Why wouldn't you want for-profit businesses that have social good, even though it's defined a little bit differently than him? Why wouldn't you want them to engage the issues when there's still a billion people or three billion people, depending on how you're slicing the pie, that are living on a dollar a day or two dollars, two dollars and fifty cents a day. It just seems to me that that's, that's a bit of a problem. So uh, the last thing I wanted to do is just, um, just point out what I think are some unfortunate uh, rhetorical statements um, that he's made. What, what he's quoted as saying is that the triple bottom line, which is companies that are trying to do social good, they need to be financially successful, they have a social good, there's an environmental good to it. That's ultimately only one bottom line in its profit. So he has taken an entire growth sector in the economy and thrown it out and said, it's really only about profits. I find that a bit irresponsible. He also says that the fundamental problem with corporate social responsibility is that it is not equipped to deal with social problems. And I find exception to that as well. As a matter of fact, even for those for-profit companies that don't have an emphasis on corporate social responsibility, I actually think that they are good for our economy because they employ people, they've met their cost of capital, the profits end up going into research and development, those people that are picking up the paycheck engage the marketplace, they end up paying their rent, they end up buying food, they end up making the economy grow, and oh, by the way, of the seven people, seven billion people on Earth, six billion of those people are actually participating in that system in a pretty significant way, and it's working quite well for many of them, okay? And, and that just gets discounted. And yet, if he were standing here, I think this is Sanyo, that's a for-profit business, and I don't know how the university club ended up being founded, but my guess is, People engaged the marketplace and then donated some money of some kind, and, and that's why you're here. Or when he speaks in chapel, 
It'll be a for-profit microphone sitting inside of a gymnasium that was donated by money and a very generous person, I think it was four and a half million dollars uh, 40, 50 years ago in order to build that, that very gym. That person engaged the marketplace and then that person ended up doing a whole bunch of social good. So I think that the argument ends up um, breaking down pretty significantly and I have, uh, I have some problems with that. Also says occasionally through a happy accident, the needs of society and opportunities for high profit happen to coincide. Uh, I know many of you in this room, I know a whole bunch of people that engage the marketplace, and I don't find them to be one-dimensional, and I don't find them to end up having a happy accident that ends up benefiting society. They actually end up being something that is uh, part of their DNA. The U.S. government is ignoring the poor. Uh, it's an argument that you hear a lot, <clears throat> and yet we end up being a relatively generous government. I think when you begin to compare it to some other expenditures, it does allow for a conversation to take place of are we spending our money the most wisely? And I would argue that we are not, but to make a statement that the United States government is ignoring the poor a person on welfare in America lives better than 96% of the people in the world. And um, so I don't think that we're necessarily ignoring the poor. There are safety nets all over the place. I think we're doing relatively good in that department and also sending money through USAID and elsewhere um, to help people. So much of the world is left behind. Well, there are a billion people and we have a problem. And there's no question about that. And that's happened over the last couple hundred years. But again, if you look at the 1,000, 1,200, 1,300 year period, we were all essentially equally the same for a 1,000 of those years. And the Industrial Revolution provided opportunities that certain people took advantage of and certain people didn't. And, and that's, that's uh, where we are. Business men and women are one-dimensional people. That's another quote that he puts. I, I spend my life uh, working with business men and women, and, and I don't know that any of them are one-dimensional people. So I point that out, again, not to disparage him, but just simply to say the comments are coming from advocacy, and he has a pulpit, and he's using that really well but it ends up being a lot of rhetoric that I was not able to find any empirical data to support. Now it might very well be that you share his viewpoint and that's great and you're entitled to that viewpoint. I just don't end up seeing the empirical data that, that supports comments like these or by saying social business, he's looking at a new stock market, he's looking at new regulations, he's looking at on and on and on, and I just think that uh, it ends up being a bit of a disaster. So um, profits stay in the business, well what about changing technology? You need, to, you need to reinvest. What about compliance issues when you create this new stock market? And who's gonna regulate that? And how do you pay the government fees? And how do you do all of those things that are necessary? What about attracting the best and brightest when there's no upside? Take all the risk, there is no reward. Um, I'm not sure that you end up with the best and brightest. What about the long-term health of the company? And that would go back to Peter Drucker or go back to Adam Smith, which essentially is you've got to be able to run companies in a profitable way. And when you do, they're healthy. And when they're healthy, guess what they can do? They can not only take care of their people, but they can be great corporate citizens. And you see that all over Santa Barbara. So uh, with that, here's my conclusion. Opinions are very deeply felt, and I think that you're going to see one of those opinions expressed on February 28th. These issues are complex, and you may land in a different place than I land, and the needs are real, and I think that's the most important part. So fortunately for us, I think that the tent is large enough for all of us to engage the issues at every level, and we should be engaging the issues. Hopefully there's a way to put aside those differences and find a way to strategically work together. And with that, I thank you. Um, that we will entertain a few of those. Yes, sir?
technology and with the exponential development of technology and then taking those four characteristics, uh, government, uh, conflict, etc. <coughs> how do you see technology affecting those four particulars? Or are they just going to become part of the dynamic on a kind of an equal basis? And sure. So if you didn't hear, the question is essentially, what role does technology play in maybe eradicating or having people emerge from those traps? Um, I think it plays a huge role. If you look at these successes in Africa, and they've traveled Africa quite a bit, if you look at um, the cell phone and cell phone technology, in much of Africa, there are no landlines. That technology, in some ways, is actually superior to ours here and it has allowed people that were previously disconnected from the world, it allows them to actually engage in activity. It allows them to be able to pull down information from the internet and educate themselves. It allows them to connect to other people around the world. So technology plays a huge role in that. And when you spend money in aid, one of the things from an infrastructure standpoint, <clears throat> excuse me, that you would want to do is you'd want to spend, strategically spend money on technology that would allow uh, the people who have been left out to actually engage the issues. Um, it, it can also end up educating the population. One of the, it's a little bit of a sidebar, but a company that I was the chairman and CEO of is actually an NGO that engaged both the presidential and parliamentary elections in, in uh, Iraq and in Afghanistan. We used technology because most of the people could not read and write, and especially women that were never afforded an opportunity for education could not read or write. So we used technology not to linearly train them, not to hold seminars, but actually to create a device where there was oral learning that took place through dramas and through plays and through song. And in those, we ended up teaching people who could not read and write what the election was about, and inform them of the options that were available to them, inform them how they could actually participate in the elections. And the data that we had um, post-election was that there, where we went, there's a 28% bump in the people that actually engaged the issues and that ended up, um, ended up voting. And many of them were the rural poor and they ended up being women. So there's, an, there's a one example of being able to use technology to, to better people. <clears throat> we had a follow-on technology that did not end up being embraced, but post-election in Afghanistan, their parliament, 65% of the people were, were illiterate. These are their legislators. Because they needed to come from all facets of society. A certain percentage needed to be female, never had an opportunity to be educated. A certain percentage of them had to come from all of the provinces in rural and urban and they never had an opportunity. So what we are going to do is create an essentially an oral magazine for them to address all of the issues so that they could intelligently vote on issues. It didn't, it didn't go through, but, um, but the elections uh, were held and, and there was a big bump. Without technology, something like that would not occur. Uh, without technology, um, when you have a farmer that is going to sell their goods, they were locked into just taking them to one place. And when they just take them to one place, you can actually be taken advantage of because the price they're going to give you is very low. If you have a phone and you know there are three or four places, you can now begin to barter. You can get more information. You can get a higher yield for your crop. And that could be, be the difference between sending your children to school or not, having meat in your diet or not. Technology plays a huge role. Yeah. Yes, sir. <coughs> Uh, how do you see the observed and predicted decline in birth rate around the world? Um, is that going to aggravate the already existing problems, or is there any help, help in that? Uh, right, so, so the question is about birth rate as it relates to growth and as it relates to uh, what's happening around the world. You know, I, I, that's, you're, I'm way outside of my expertise at that point. What I can do is I can point out that the, the one-child rule inside of China, if you look at China and you look at India, and they're roughly the same size, but if you look at the demographics, they're, they're significantly different. In China, the average age is 47. In India, it is 28. If you use 
human resources as a natural resource, then you could make the statement that it is a natural resource that moved a country from a third world status to a first world status 100% of the time with one exception. And that one exception is India. They use their brains to be able to engineer their way out of, and it's not the whole country, but that's what they've done. So you end up with an aging population in China. You end up with a growing dissatisfaction of the 20 year olds that are of marrying age and there are no females. And if you know and understand, I've been inside of China several times, there are, um, there are ethnic issues inside of China as well, so that you do want to marry inside of this or that or that. And, and so it, that, that ends up being a, a growing problem. The West is where all the agriculture was, and young people have moved into the East, into suburban areas, into urban areas, and they're not going back and taking care of their family, which is a 4,000 year long tradition. So you end up seeing a lot of significant um, problems that are there at the same time that the economy is slowing and some of the infrastructure problems are occurring. Uh, they've, they've studied actually the ice melt in the Sierra Nevadas and I've heard that 23% of the pollution that we end up getting in the California mountains are coming from China. It's just staggering some of the issues that they end up facing and I think that would relate to um, aging and, and birth rate. Yes, sir. Uh, overall, do you see microcredit as a good movement or not? And uh, secondly, how, how would you improve it? How would improvements would you see? Right. To be made. Sure. Uh, overall, I think it's very positive because for the person who's a recipient, it's great as long as there are checks and balances. The initial knock was on the bankers that why are you without collateral? How can you how can you possibly see these people starving and not do something about it? Well, there are rules and regulations that are in place that may have prohibited them from doing that. As it grows, they become a little bit more engaged in the issue. Some of them have. Some people take advantage of it. Some people don't. The key is, uh, much like the top down, bottom up, you really need to know where you are, uh, where you're operating. I'll take 14 students into port pay Haiti, and we are studying the issues weekly for three and a half hours of our class period on FaceTime with people. And in, in the, uh, the northwest part of Haiti, it is culturally unacceptable for you to have a dollar in your pocket and not offer it to somebody if they ask you for it. It can be a distant relative, it could be a neighbor, it could be somebody that you barely know. And because of that cultural unacceptability of doing that, you never end up with the savings account. But what it does is it's gonna perpetuate the same cycle that your children also will not be educated. And so what we've done is strategically gone in and said, we're going to hire three people year-round to be able to handle this, and we're training them right now. And they are going to choose seven small business owners. It's coming from the chief justice of the area. It's coming from the mayor. It's coming from a, a mission organization. They're choosing these seven people. We're going through training with them. Our students are helping them to write business plans that are, um, that are acceptable and that introduce some um, checks and balances that we would have inside of capitalism that they may not be used to. And then there are um, three things that occur when they engage the marketplace. So if someone is a, has a moped and they're going to drive a taxi, we'll be looking at the odometer and the changes in the odometer and see how many miles that they've run, how many taxi rides that they've had, and on a daily basis for accountability purposes, we'll be tracking all of that we will be collecting that money. The three buckets, one of them goes to them. The second one goes to paying back the loan on, at a very modest rate, but we, we want them to feel at the end of the day that they've paid back the loan so that they own the moped. And the third one is a savings account that does not go into their pocket. It's actually saved somewhere else in order to prevent that very thing from happening. And so it's just a matter of being smart about the area that you are in. Bangladesh is going to be different, and parts of Africa are going to be different, but you really need to know and understand the pulse of what's happening. 
And so when you look at $3 trillion in 50 or 60 years, and it never gets at the granular level, we're never in the weeds understanding how many children are in that village, obviously that's a problem. I think the right solution is go enter the village. We're doing this without an LLC. We're doing this without a website. We're doing this without fanfare. 14, 21-year-olds hopping on a plane and going and rocking the world of seven entrepreneurs. And then we're gonna do it next year. And then we're gonna do it the next year. And by that time, the first year's loans should be paid back. And over a five-year period or so, there could be 40 or 50 new companies that are there with a trained populace of Haitians that are running the program. At that point, we could actually extract ourselves from that. And now you have a sustainable revenue model that allows for savings that allows for that capital expenditure, that allows for that disaster, that allows your children to go to school, that allows meat in your diet. So what we've done is just study one little community, and, and I think that that's probably the most effective model. Um, it, doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be a top-down thing. That, that's, that's what I would advocate. And when that happens, then I think you end up having a very, very positive effect. The downside to that is um, there, are, um, there are, are programs called 1011 programs and 56 programs. The 1011 program is essentially I will give you $10 in the morning, you give me $11 at night. I give you $5 in the morning, you give me $6 at night. It's 10 to 20 percent daily. Annualize that and you're at 3,500 to 7,000 percent interest. But because there's no infrastructure and they don't understand what's going on and that transaction has to occur daily and the amount is so small, it's, it's what happens in certain parts of the world. And then you can see this trap that people get into. They fall into, out of one because now they've got some money and they can engage the marketplace. And they fall into another as, as, uh, as being a debtor that our banking system because of the rules and regulations, probably would not allow because it would say this is just not viable. So there's some benefits uh, both ways. Yeah. Yes, sir. What is the economic explanation for a small country like Norway to become one of the wealthiest countries in the world, but every man, woman, and child is the equivalent of a millionaire because of the size of their sovereign? Uh, you mentioned Singapore, mm -hmm. but Norway is a small country, 79 billion people. How can they stand out? And every other you know, country in Western Europe that's equally developed, we're not able to achieve that well. Is there an economic explanation? Oh, I have an answer right down here. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's, it is, uh, and it's not just Norway, it's actually a lot of the Scandinavian countries where you end up having deep sea ports, you end up having shipping, you end up having oil, you end up having natural resources that are not dominated by bad governance. So you end up having this, this, uh, this shared wealth. And what they've done with that is they've actually been able to diversify their economy. So when you go to Oslo, you're not just looking at, oh, it's all oil. And you can look at some Middle Eastern countries where that is the case and they've not diversified. And when the oil dries up, they'll actually be nomads. And then you can look at their neighbors right next door, like a Dubai, which I've been to several times, and you look at the infrastructure that they're building so that there's more of a sustainable revenue model. And, and then you have that. But it comes out of natural resources and it comes out of good governance. Um, and and, and, uh, and that's, how, that's how that happens. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yes, ma'am. Is there any chance or any way to economically encourage more communication uh, for those that are in charge of the distribution of these, of these trillion, three trillion in support so that they're not duplicating effort, they're talking to each other, and they're actually going out and looking at the villages that they're supposed to be helping? Yeah. So they know who they're helping and why and how? Sure. So the, the question ends up being, why? We have all this information and all this technology and we know that we're spending adequate resources for it. Why don't we just talk to each other? And, and the, the quick answer is bureaucracy and being pedantic. It's about as simple as that. 
Uh, my dissertation at Oxford was on original economic theory and international distributive justice. And my argument was that we had it right all along because actually Adam Smith and both the theory of moral sentiments and the wealth of nations addressed that. He had a third book that he was actually going to write. It was more on jurisprudence and individual rights. He never got to do that. But essentially what he was doing is, is trying to create a system where nobody was left behind and where people did take care of, um, of their neighbors. The biggest problem, if you go back to the Millennium Development Goals and you look at all the bureaucracy that's happening, that's a problem. The other thing that's a problem is if you look at um, the UN and where they will go, if you look at the worst of the worst places, they never have an office there. You can look at some pretty bad places and they have offices there, but if you look at the worst of the worst, they're not engaging those issues. Um, I've been to uh, Kano State in northern Nigeria, 95% Muslim, and we ended up giving, we went once, we came back again, and we ended up giving, he, was a, he looked like he was 90, he was 57 year old tribal leader of 50,000 people inside of a village. We took a picture of them and we had it framed, and we actually gave him the picture, and he looked at it stunned, and then they told him, that's you. <laughs> in 57 years, he'd never seen his face. The UN's nowhere to be found um, in, in those places. And so, you know, it, it's a, it, at least if I can throw in a kind of a personal opinion, as, as a Christ follower, we have the largest distribution channel in the face of the planet in that there are Christians that are all over the place, presumably caring people. And if we actually had the body of Christ functioning as well as it could function, we can solve many of these issues. So I spent an hour blasting the government, but in a lot of ways, the government is stepping into a gap that's been abdicated by the church. And so we need to get really smart and strategic because the church spends an awful lot of money sending people in an event-driven way, but it doesn't necessarily permeate a lifestyle. So I think that if everybody shows up and shows up strategically, um, that, would be, that would be good. My dissertation essentially on the last page said, let's take a giant step backwards. And essentially what I was saying is have the CEO of a multinational corporation and have the executive director of an NGO go to the pub and have a beer and try and speak each other's language because that's not happening at all. On one hand, it's name and shame. On the other, it is you are a nuisance and you just wait for the conflict to occur, when in essence you end up having two very good people that could come together and say, you know, if we work together here, you care about the community, I care about the community, let's work together and make that happen. We're empowered to do that. Uh, we're just not spending enough time uh, on that. And, and I think that's a problem. I remember years ago being in a Sunday school class and we are all white and we are all wealthy and we are talking about ways to engage the African-American population. And a dear friend of mine said, <clears throat> I just, I, I, don't, I don't understand so I don't know how to engage. And I just read the week before that in Gary, Indiana, which is um, a high concentration of African-American population, that the local McDonald's knows from the Big Mac to the Burger King to the double cheeseburger on every 10 minute increments exactly what's bought in their area. So if we care enough about an issue, we can actually break it down and be strategic about it. But when we don't care enough about the issue, then it's a problem. So a lot of it just ends up being, um, I think, individual will and caring enough to, to make that happen. That's where I'm proud of our students to say, yeah, I'll give up my spring break and we'll hop on a plane <coughs> and we'll go change the lives of seven people and then we'll go back and do it again and go back and do it again. And if this system works, and there'll be some problems, but if the system works and if we're strategically thinking about it, we can actually change an entire community. I think that's the right way to handle it. So I think that we are out of time. So thank you very much for coming. <laughs>